This is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast for visiting television, sci-fi, fantasy, and everything in between. This week, Earth 2, episodes 18 and 19. We have reason to believe that the psychic energy field from the Tyrian corpse has somehow found a host. A host? What do you mean, another host? One of us, Martin. (laughs) That's ridiculous. No, it's not. Now, we have to go about this simply and methodically. Now, Dansker has devised a way to test for the presence of the psychic energy field amongst us. Oh, the radiometer's smashed. I figured a way to jerry-rig it. Wait a second. Are you saying that one of us is possessed and walking around? Or locked in the trans rover? It's hard to even tell if this person is even aware that this psychic energy is within them. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast based on the novella Who Goes There by John W. Campbell Jr. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? I had something that's real, but now I'm uh, I'm interested in what you had mentioned. What is that? What's this based on? <laughs> that's uh, be- it's because this first episode that we're gonna watch uh, is very much a uh, that retread of the thing where you don't know who the enemy is, like oh. it's in your midst. Oh, and I was gonna say based on the thing, but that's the original novella. The thing was based on. <laughs> <laughs> Comparing this to the thing is very flattering to this show. I mean, it's a, it's a generous comparison. They didn't yeah. do a great job, but it was it was that kind of a plot. So I was like, no, we'll, we'll call it based on this novel. We'll obviously get back to it. But man, how many times have you seen this in a TV show? Huh? The like, who, who's the alien or who's the spy sort of thing? I mean, like, it's a classic plot that uh, that novel goes back to the 1940s. It's been uh, kicking around for a while, I think. Still works. Also, Jordan, you know what is real this week? What's that? We don't have a guest. It's just you, me and you this time. Isn't that nice? It seems like it's been a while. It's at least been, it's been like a month or something like that. I think we've done three straight episodes with guests. You and I can now just uh, bad talk people because it's just you and me. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be all catty about our guests. We'll review our previous guests. <laughs> That's a new segment. Who is the best? Who is the worst? It's hot or not. Who wore it best? <laughs> Real great way to have our friends and family back on the podcast. <laughs> All right, Jordan. Well, before we get into this week's episodes, I think it's about time that we reboot Earth 2 as a major motion picture. If you look around the internet... There's not like a lot of conversations still happening about the show, but anytime there is conversation about this show, it is legitimately everyone's just like, oh, Netflix should just remake this. Well, there you go. I'm in the minority. It is a show that I think people still actually remember very fondly and are just like, just remake it. Why not? Although, really, you wouldn't need the branding of Earth 2. Like, this is like, this is just any show where you go to another planet. You could do this with anything. The actual overall story of the show is generic enough that you can call it anything. So all you aspiring screenwriters out there, you can just remake Earth 2 without crediting it. It's pretty easy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Jordan, I've got a list of uh, so many cast members here, so we should get into it. Mm -hmm. Shall we start off with our lead, Devin Adair, who brought us to Earth 2? I'm going to say off the bat, I don't know how excited I am about any of my picks. Oh, is not uninspired? Some of mine are more inspired than others, so... I don't know. It's not that it's uninspired. I just... The characters are all so two-dimensional. You could throw anyone in, really. I mean, you just, that's it. We're trying to elevate these characters, maybe. Maybe give them something a little bit better. I, I don't know if I've landed every single time, but it's certainly a large budget film I've decided to make. Okay, well, well why don't you, how many do you have for Devin? I pretty much have one for everybody with a few exceptions. Okay, well, I have two for almost all of them. So let's, why don't I give you my first then? Yeah, do it. My first for Devin, and I, again, I don't know how excited I am about this, but I, I like her as an actress, and I think maybe... She's probably in the right age age range now, which is Michelle Williams. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's not, I mean that's not bad. That's, I can see it. I can certainly see it. I decided I was just like, who's gonna like anchor this big science fiction spectacular? Um, we need somebody who can like I know can bring it for this. And I went with Charlize Theron. Oh wow, yeah, I can see that. I think she elevates the material. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? My other pick, which I wasn't excited about at all because I'm already tired of seeing her of everything, which is Elizabeth Moss. But I think Charlize <laughs> Theron is the is the way to go. 
<laughs> okay, we'll go show this. It's funny, though. Yeah, Michelle Williams, actually, if you were going to make a more, like, true to this, th- like, she's actually not a bad replacement to the kind of person who's currently in this show. I think she might get a little irritating over time, but, like... Yeah, maybe. Just because she's she doesn't have that leadership quality that uh, Charlie's there now. Yeah, no, I agree. This this is, uh, we got our, our star-studded beginnings. Now, let's move on to her paramour in, in the wings, <laughs> John Danzinger. <laughs> I got two picks again. Well, I'll go first because I've got three picks. Okay. I just went with any one of the three Chris's, Pine, uh, Hemsworth, or um, Pratt. I mean, they're all pretty interchangeable, right? I'll be honest, I think Pratt's the winner there because... The thing about Danzinger is, it's just like having the lead we have right now, is I feel like Pratt's like, he's charismatic enough that you think you're going to like him, but if you spend a little too much time with him, you kind of get tired. (laughs) Which is how I kind of feel about uh, the guy who's, what's the name of the guy who's leading it right now? Oh, uh, Clancy Brown? Clancy Brown. Who are your picks? Weirdly, my first pick was Tom Hardy. But which oh, is yeah. weird to mix with Charlize Theron in their Mad Max reunion. But apparently they hated each other. So I'll go with my second pick, which is really, really going down. And it's going to change the feel of this movie, which is Jason Momoa. Hey, you know what? I like it. I like Jason Momoa for the role. Yeah, is that what we're doing? Yeah, I think that's the way to go. I actually think that's uh, that's a way more fun Danzinger. Like, that's like a big blue collar guy, but he's a, got a heart of gold. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, who do you have next? Let's go to Yale next. I've only got one choice here. I won't be surprised if we overlap even with one choice. Okay. Uh, my pick for Yale was Morgan Freeman. Oh, you're really going older. See, I picked an alumni of our show. I made him a little bit younger, a little bit sexier. I just Alba. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, what do we think? That's some real star power there. Well, I mean, so is Morgan Freeman. Let's not uh, let's not shortchange him for sure. My mine's a little less action oriented though. My, my, my Morgan Freeman's a little too old to do much running around. I think at this point, yes, the the Yale model will be very old. I don't know. I can go either way. What do you think? I think we go with Idris Elba just to keep pumping the young, sexy people in. I think they're not that young and sexy, but you know, <laughs> younger and sexier than Morgan Freeman, anyway. F- certainly, certainly younger and sexier than your Morgan Freeman. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, next up, we've got Doctor Julia Heller. Uh, who did you go with? I have two odd picks, I think. The first is Elizabeth Olsen. Right. I was just like, meh. I mean, and then no, I not. I thought we would change things up a little bit. And because I think she's big with the kids, Aquafina. Oh, I mean, I'm a, I, she's big with me. So I, I, I do like that so far. I went almost not quite the same way, but a similar route with Dr. Julia Heller. I was like, can we bring like someone more fun into this role? So I went with a comedian and uh, actress um, from Saturday Night Live and the movie Obvious Child, Jenny Slate. Hmm. Interesting. She's a little more nebbish than uh, Aquafina for sure, but I-, I thought she might bring some more fun awkwardness to it. But you know what? Let's go with Aquafina. Let's make it a full on. She's a very different character, but uh, it's a lot more fun. Well, I mean, Dr. Heller, uh, n- no offense to the actress, but she's such a blah character. I mean, you could say that about any of these th- any of these characters. Sadly, <laughs> that is true. All right, next up, Alonzo Solis. I got two beefy guys. What do you got? I I went through it. I'm like, how do you cast Alonzo Solis? And I'm just like, it's got to be a model turned actor. <laughs> yeah. And I ended up with three picks because I was I just googled them like models turned actors, and I was like, who who are my options here? So here are my three picks, and we can go through your two and really narrow it down. I went through with model turned actor. Tyrese Gibson from the Fast and the Furious movies. Okay. Model turned actor. Uh, this one, less actory, but Tyra Banks. Okay. And then finally, model turned actor Mila Jovovich. <laughs> There's something so weird about that that I really like. I also like the idea of it almost uh, determines who the director is because doesn't she only do movies where her husband directs? I don't even think they're married anymore. They just, they just uh, hang out stuff. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll give you my two, but I'm kind of leaning towards her. I had picked Henry Cavill, Superman. Oh, of course. And I don't know why this was funny to me, but it changes the character a lot. And it's his age now. It's Gerard Butler. <laughs> oh, poor Gerard Butler. <laughs> I'm not ready to get him back into Hollywood yet, so <laughs> we're moving past that. So let's go with Mila Jojovich. I do like her. I think this is the right kind of film for her. It's a smaller role than usual, but you know what? I'm a big fan of hers. I'll, I'll watch all those crap, all that crap she's in. So now it's Alonza Solis. Alonza Solis? Yeah. I was just going to say Ali Solis. But oh, she... there you go. Next up, your favorite, Morgan Martin. 
It is the only one I have only one pick for. I also have one pick, and uh, when it came to me, I'm like, yep, I got it. Uh, so let's hear yours first. Rami Malek. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see him as that kind of like... I think this is where his career is going. I think he's just going to play like weird, annoying people. Weird, annoying people. I decided I went with like, he's a bureaucrat who's really annoying and like you you kind of have trouble liking. I went with Ricky Gervais. <laughs> oh, oh, that's it. There you go. We're done. As soon as I thought, I'm like, yep, nobody's more annoying than Ricky Gervais. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, next up, Bess Morgan. I don't know now because I, this person has to be married to Ricky Gervais. So I'm going to I'm going to drop my first one, which was Anya Taylor Joy, only because she's in everything. OK, but that's just too creepy a couple. And it's still a creepy couple. But I had Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Oh, yeah. I decided for best Martin that it, it is time to let back into Hollywood. Tara Reid. <laughs> Perfect. Done. <laughs> Just Ricky Gervais and Tara Reid wandering around in the background. If I've ever seen a power couple, Ricky Gervais and Tara Reid, that's as good as you're going to get. Uh, they make sense together, I think. Um, all right. Now, uh, I'm, uh, we're moving on to the kids now. Here's Ulysses Adair, the uh, small boy who's the would-be the Tarian king. I think that's how that went. Yeah. Do you want to go first, or should I? I'm going to mention something for both the children. I have a little bit of a, a different thing. Both of them are actually CGI characters because I hate the children so much. So... They're, it's actually just the voice actor doing the child for my pick. So it's a computer-generated character, and it's a child still, but it's voiced by Mark Hamill. <laughs> Mark, Mark Hamill. It sounds like the Joker. Yeah. <laughs> Jordan, uh, at least for Yuli anyway, you and I were almost on the same wavelength. Not quite. I think what we should do is I think we need to take the technology pioneered by the Waynes brothers in Little Man, combine it with the technology uh, pioneered by Morgan Scorsese in The Irishman, and we take a child, we de-age Tom Hanks's face, and we slap it on the front. Done. Perfect. De-aged child Tom Hanks is you. <laughs> That's pretty great. Who do you have for True? For True, I actually did cast a child just because I thought uh, Yuli's going to be this freak CG character and I wanted to have to act against the real child. <laughs> so who do you have? Uh, I just had to basically go through a list of like, who are good child actors right now? Um, so uh, for True Danzinger, I have cast Archie Yates, who was the chubby friend in Jojo Rabbit. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that because I wouldn't have known who that was. I don't think most people would, but he was the best part of Jojo Rabbit, I think. That little uh, chubby kid who was a Nazi. Yeah. He... <laughs> little chubby Nazi. That was the first title for the movie. Do you know that? A working title. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Who did you who did you have for that role as, as your voice actor? I have a little computer generated little girl uh, voiced by Kristen Wiig <laughs> doing a hilarious voice. Uh, I don't care. What do you think? No, I think we're going with little chubby Nazi. <laughs> okay, great. Archie Yates, you're hired. You're, he's a good kid. He's very <laughs> yeah. adorable. I quite liked him. And I don't know. True could be a boy's name. So we're keeping the name the same. Right. Do you have one for zero? I don't have one for zero. Okay, well, let me give you a two. I just thought two actors who have good voices, and you can pick who you like for zero. Because obviously, right. they don't need to be in the costume. They're just calling, they're zooming this thing in. Uh, I got Liam Neeson. <laughs> <laughs> or, did you hear? Did you hear there's a rumor that he's uh, coming He's coming back to reboot uh, The Naked Gun with a guy who makes Family Guy? Oh, no. No. As a big Naked Gun fan, please don't. It's gonna. What's his name? What's the guy who makes Family Guy? Oh, I don't know his name. He's very pleased Seth, with himself Seth, all the time. Seth something. Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane. William Neeson, the naked guy. Yeah, thanks for that. On My second pick is Ewan McGregor. You're so depressed now. Your second pick was like dragged yeah. out of you. Well, who wants to see that movie? No one. Uh, let's go with Ewan McGregor. All right. And do you have a director for this? Well, I got one more thing for you before oh. we move on, Director Jordan. I have decided arbitrarily you, you don't get a say in this we're having a special guest appearance by tim curry as gall oh okay oh no i'm i'm in for that perfect is he also getting cgi'd or is his character now suffering he's the just very old Lustro? probably doesn't stand up a lot mm. i think we have to make a lot of you know concessions for his age right uh, but it's still worth it like the fans are gonna go nuts we've said it before i think we've said on on past podcasts this show at this point is so desperate for tim curry to come back this is why I mentioned it. I don't think we've done an episode of this podcast about this show in the last like four or five of them where like there wasn't a five minute digression into Tim Curry. <laughs> well, it just shows how good he was and how how lacking it is in this show. All right. Let's move on to the directors. 
I've got it. This is a director. He hasn't directed anything in quite some time. <laughs> He's coming out of retirement for this movie. He demands at least a two hundred million dollar budget because all this is gonna be shot on green screen, and it's George Lucas. George Lucas. We're bringing George Lucas. Back, yeah. Right? <laughs> He's busy building his museum to no, himself. No, he saw that Earth 2 was coming back. He was a big fan, and he thought, you know what? I can ruin this, too. <laughs> Poor George Lucas. I think history has vindicated him. Has it? I believe now people love the prequels. No, they don't. They do. No. No one likes the prequels. The prequels are have been recessed. They're great. They're perfect films. Mm, okay, sure. <laughs> I went in a very different direction than you in some ways. Because I looked at this, I looked at all the stupid actors I had to write down to like build this list of recasting, and it's like, this is truly an ensemble film. I mean, we didn't even get into all the background characters who have names and run around in the show. <laughs> and in these couple episodes, they have a lot of dialogue. Uh, so I'm like, who is going to bring this ensemble to the screen? And you know who it is, Jordan? Who is it? Aaron Sorkin. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. Aaron Sorkin's perfect. A lot perfect. of walking, a lot of talking. There's a lot of scenes of them walking through their biosphere. All right. Want me to recap this whole thing? Yeah, let's we do it. Well, the, the fans need to know uh, what they're lining up for. This, like, 75-minute segment about how to recast <laughs> this movie. <laughs> Here is the reboot of Earth 2 coming to theaters. Summer 2021? We can turn it around in time, right? Mm-hmm. Here we go. Uh, Devin Adair is played by Charlize Theron. John Danzinger, Jason Momoa, Yale the Robot Tutor, Idris Elba, Dr. Julia Heller, Aquafina, Alonzo, or now perhaps Ali Salas, Mila Jovovich, Morgan Martin, Ricky Gervais, Bess Martin is played by Tara Reid, <laughs> Ulysses Adair is a de-aged Tom Hanks slapped onto a child's body, True Danzinger is played by Archie Yates, the chubby kid from Jojo Rabbit. Mm-hmm. Zero is voiced by uh, Ewan McGregor, hopefully in his original accent. One would hope. Uh, then we have a special appearance, of course, by Tim Curry, which is a big surprise at the end of the uh, near the end of the movie. <laughs> oh, he just he just shows up, wheels by, and waves. <laughs> and of course, it's all directed by Aaron Sorkin. This is his big multi multi million dollar sci fi spectacular. He's been dying to make. It's amazing. What a movie! And that's how you remake a movie. It's done. I mean, basically, all the hard work is complete. <laughs> all right. Should we get into this episode? Mm-hmm. Here's the IMDb summary for episode 18, After the Thaw. Day 109. While foraging for food during the harsh winter, Julia finds a Tarian body frozen in the ice. The hope of learning more about the native inhabitants turns to fear as strange things start to happen around the camp. And that was courtesy of Netaholic. <laughs> Netaholic, N-E-T? Absolutely. He's addicted to the net. <laughs> no, not that this is important. Is he addicted to the internet or is he addicted to the uh, Sandra Bullock movie, The Net? Oh, good question. I'll have to reach out and find out. I'll send a message. Please let me know. All his other summaries are about the net. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. All he wants to talk about. Why is no one talking about the net? There is a movie they need to bring back, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, this episode begins with the Eden Project sort of wandering around the snow-covered landscape, looking for food. This is, uh, we're very much continuing the trying to survive the winter motif of this sh- latter half of this show. And uh, we really, this time, finally started getting a glimpse of those uh, falcons we've been hearing. I don't know if you noticed this, but I, we finally get to see them flying above the treetops. Oh, I know. I never saw them, but they it's so crazy how often you hear the bird. Well, that's why I was surprised that we finally get to see them. I'm like, oh, there they are. There are a lot of them around. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Dr. Heller, as she's on this little journey, I think with uh, Alonzo and Danzinger and whomever else is on it, she uh, she takes a tumble down a snow-covered hill and ends up landing face-to-face with the Tarian equivalent of a frozen caveman in the ice. I know they say pretty quickly that it's a Tarian, but it didn't look like a Tarian based on its frozen features. I, well, they really only give you a good look at its eye initially, and they're like, what's this going to be? I was hoping it was going to be an episode of uh, Unfrozen Caveman Tarian Lawyer, but... What a reference. <laughs> anyway, uh, despite everyone's protests over finding this frozen frozen Tarian caveman uh, and that the fact they should be focusing on finding food to survive, Dr. Heller makes them cut the frozen Tarian out of the ice in a big ice box so she can study it. This whole episode, and Danziger is starting to get a little annoying... He's not wrong that they should be looking for food because clearly that's an issue. But he just, it's like he everything he says is justified because they need food. 
Well, and it's funny. I've noticed that too. Like even the next episode, Morgan's correct when he gives them gives them basically his opinion, but he's just so annoying that you don't want to take it. Like you don't want to listen to him. I've just noticed that too. It's like all the characters are usually correct. It's just about how annoying they are when they deliver their correct information. Right. <laughs> right. But the point is you have this small little argument that of course doesn't really amount to anything, which is Danziger is angry because he wants to look for food and she's all like, but disease immunities, we might find something. I know. I thought it was so funny. She's like, what are we going to learn from this? She's like, I don't know. We might discover a disease immunity. I'm like, that's a pretty nebulous thing to like spend a half a day digging she's really making her argument right they're like well what like we're wasting time what are we gonna find she's like the cure to all sickness you're like oh okay yeah it's grendler spit we figured that out (laughs) yeah that's true Uh, anyway they move this ice cube into a tent at camp which i couldn't quite make it out but does does the narration say they called it the alien pit (laughs) i didn't hear that so let's say yes i was like okay so they started calling this tent the alien pit and i was just like also you're the aliens on this planet. The Terrian lives on this planet. Now, let me ask you this. Right, right at this back, they're going to have brought a big, like, essentially big block of ice where the yes. Terrian is, I think they say it's a 300,000-year-old Terrian. I've like got all in, those details written down. So yeah, so so it's sitting it's sitting in a uh, block, and they're just going to let it slowly melt on its own? That was what they were doing? I mean, that's the question. I'm not sure. She seems to be scanning it with her instruments and her power glove. And like, yeah, they discover how old it is. They discover that its DNA is more consistent to humans than it is to modern Terrians. I guess implying that they've evolved to be more like the planet. Mm -hmm. They say something weird, too. What is it? It's, uh... Oh, yeah, she's like, it has a spine, not like current Terrians. I was just like, wait, what? Terrians don't have spines anymore? Well, it's a funny thing they've pushed into several times in this show, which is, and I'm not, it's not a criticism. It's that, that the Terrians are not really, despite the appearance of being humanoid, they're not humanoid. The problem, I think, is, is that they're so clearly just a guy in a costume that when they say things like, it doesn't have a normal skeletal structure and all these things, it's like, yeah, but they, that's how they look. It's not like they have made them Someone has gone, oh, they don't have a backbone, so what would, how would this creature move? Or how the mythology they're building is consistent with how what we're seeing. Or if, or if it's supposed to be like more like the planet, just be like, oh, this one's spine is made of bone instead of rocks like modern. You know, like, it's right, just like, right. it, I was like, it has a spine, you guys. Look, look at it. She's also not a very good doctor. And uh, she also notices this notices is 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 uh that the frozen caveman tarian still has some residual psychic energy inside <laughs> i don't know much about uh scanning or researching frozen objects or uh things from the past but i'm assuming one you take them out of the ice before you scan it she's scanning it through the ice which led me to believe why don't you just scan it where you found it if you don't need to take it out and then how do you scan for psychic energy I mean, that was what was weird. It's like, still some energy in there. I'm like, and then so at first I was like, oh, so it's still alive and they're going to de thought and get to talk to it. And then that later, uh, that's not the case. But I was just like, how do you, how does one know what energy is? It's just one of those throwaway lines you're not supposed to think about too much. Absolutely. Um, That night, as visualized by uh, one of those shots where the camera like is free floating around, flying into people's tents and looking at them as they sleep, we come to see that the uh, everyone is being terrorized by this freaky looking ancient Terrian in their dreams. Um, It's very much a Terrian Freddy Krueger. It like pops up and like wrestles (laughs) you in your dream. That's true. That is what he is. That would it be better if he had a little hat too, little fedora? It'd be good. I I liked what they did with the ancient Terrian. It did look uh, a lot more grizzled and gross looking than the current Terrians that already look gross. I thought he was a better looking. I don't want to say puppet, but costume than the than the Terrians were used to. I thought it was more interesting looking. Yeah, I thought it was good. I mean, I already think the Terrians look really weird and gross, but they really like amped that up in this old one. I was like, oh, good job, you guys. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the next morning, Dr. Heller waves off everyone's concerns over the significance of these dreams. She's like, ah, I don't think they mean anything. Just get over it. Which I thought was hilarious since the last, like, five episodes have been about how important dreams and the dreamscape are. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, the dreams are as important as the plot needs it to be on this show. <laughs> the, to be like, after all these episodes of dreams being important, she's like, I don't think dreams mean anything. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, plus when she scans, she goes back into that tent that morning after all the bad dreams. She scans the frozen caveman. And that psychic energy has gone. So don't worry, everybody. It's 100% dead now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the the ability of to scan for psychic energy aside, you think there would be some precautions if you 
found a creature that that's old like if it, now in our uh, time period we found a neanderthal and, and thought him out and we're finding some sort of sign of life of whatever it would be you would think you'd take some sort of precautions as opposed to just like i guess we'll just leave this thing sitting here yeah I'll just let it thaw out and die properly <laughs> yeah um but i think what's really happening here is this idea of this ancient alien Terrian thing frozen ice is kind of freaking out the whole camp not only is it a waste of time it's also like causing some panic in the camp our increasingly active background actors here are uh, really concerned about it we get we get scenes with Baines and Wallman getting the heebie-jeebies about what they call ice cube Harry they don't care for him in terms of the actual show I don't know if we've seen it in one of the shows we've watched but the background people, let's call them, or minor characters, who we didn't even know had names till like episode 10 or something, have a lot of dialogue in some episodes. But they also have a really large cast. Now, do you think they just want to show and give the idea that this is a big world we're playing with? That there's all these people that you see all the time and they sometimes have conversations and have dialogue? Or is it they just don't know what to do with their main characters? Because you could easily have had Morgan be worried or have... Devin be worried or whatever you know yeah i don't know part of me thinks or originally thought they were adding one additional character uh, bane specifically you can see i think he's the first one they named and started giving mm-hmm. lines to and i thought they were just doing that because they were going to kill him in a few episodes but now they've just added more, and more like i'll tell you right now there is another character we've seen before in the background it's a guy with a big beard and suddenly this episode he gets a name they're like, hey, Cameron, how's it going? And, I'm, and he gets a bunch of lines. And I'm like, oh, wow. So we now have Baines, Wallman, Magus, and Cameron, four characters who are just in the background with no names for the first, like, three or four episodes, now are all, like, named living characters on the yeah. show. And I'm just like, I don't know what the end game is. I thought at first it was just a cheap way of getting a, a kill that mattered. But now I'm just like, wow, we just, like, have all of these characters. Personally, I think they just want to have it the world be bigger i think they want to have these people be more than background characters but i do think in some ways it's detrimental to the show because there's just too many people just just people everywhere i'll be honest every now they've added all these i just really want to do an episode where it's just about those four characters i don't want the i I want all the other characters to be in the background of an episode and just to follow these four people around because i'm just more interested in them right now because i guess i know the least about them i think we're too far down the line though for that to happen I know, very sad. Um, anyway, Baines and Wallman are freaked out about Ice Cube Harry, and they seem to be the only people on... They, like, are always saddled with watch every night. So mm-hmm. that night when wa- they're on their watch, they, like, were, are, they hear a noise inside of the alien's tent, and they go inside, and they find that the rhodometer has been broken, uh, which was the device that could measure psychic energy. Somehow it's gotten broken in this tent. And then they hear a scream outside, and the other background character, Magus, has found a Grendler that has been imploded in the middle of camp. (laughs) (laughs) These poor Grendlers, they're always getting it in these episodes. Yeah, so all our background characters are basically finding all this spooky stuff at night, and uh, Old Baines is just like, I'm done with this, thank you very much. He goes into one of the vehicles, locks the doors, and says, I'm not coming out until someone solves this mystery. (laughs) Which I thought was a funny thing, but I also don't know if he was justified in his reaction, such a large reaction so early on. It's like there's a slight odd thing that happened and he's locked himself in. Really? Weirder things have happened. Yeah, I mean, I think they needed to like really play up the Freddy Krueger dreams to get them more freaked out, I think. That's what I'm saying, but like not enough stuff happened to justify that freak out. And they needed him to be in there because he has to be like a red herring later in the show. Like he's not with the rest of the group. Could it be him kind of thing? I'll say this. I like I said, I like these background characters. I really want to follow them. So like it was really funny to be like, let's follow this character. Just like, nope, I'm noping out of this situation. You guys come get me once you figure this out. I mean, I do like that. I, I like anything that takes a turn that you're not expecting. And for a character to say there's something scary and go, I don't want to be involved in that. I do support that. I just think they probably could have used one of their major characters. But regardless. Regardless, I suppose that's true. Uh, so the next morning after all these scary events, uh, Dr. Heller discovers that the ancient Terrian body in the tent is also missing. Um, they start a search, of course, because that's what you do. And they find Danzinger in the woods. He's dragged the body out and burnt it to ashes because he's like, oh, I'm done with these scary events. Like, everyone's freaking out. We don't need this stupid ancient Terrian. I'm just, I just burnt it to smithereens. Uh, let's continue with our lives. Now, wasn't that like... I mean, what executive decision by him and and probably in character for him just to sort of be uh, bullheaded and act without thinking. 
But also, my the literally the first thing I thought was, I don't see any body on that uh, on that fire. <laughs> I think that was more to do with the uh, lack of budget for that. Right. They were like, we can't burn a fake Tarian. Uh, just to have a bunch of ashes on the ground. Right. You were immediately suspicious. Where did the body go? I was suspicious. Yeah. Also, even for a character that, as I said, is often rash, it seemed even more so. That's funny. I mean, and this is part of it. Like, this is he's going to be part of the red herrings of this episode. I honestly, it felt in character to me for him to, like, make an executive decision and burn this body. Even though it's, like, the dumbest move you could make, like, to, like, not win friends. I was like, that's in his character. As you're saying, it's a red herring because we're going to come to a thing where now, for some reason, it's very cold in the camp. And everyone's sort of angry at Julia because things feel weird. And now they're having physical feelings of weirdness. Again, I don't know if it's really executed that well what they're going for. I think you're right. They're going for this everyone's scared to go to sleep Freddy Cougar sort of thing. But I don't know if I, I ever got the feeling of what they were trying to convey. Yeah, I mean... They're trying to get this idea across, like, because they also mentioned, like, that night while this was all happening, the generators were smashed, and that's why they're, like, don't have enough energy to be warm. And they're, like, wondering, like, what could be causing this? Like, are the Tarians mad that we robbed that grave? And I was just like, something you should have thought about before you dug up a body. But... Yeah. <laughs> and again, they could apparently scan through the ice, so why they had to dig them up, I don't know. There's also a theory floating around. It's like, maybe they've just upset the balance of nature somehow. Like, there's a lot of just wild theories thrown around. But this is when Devin and Danzinger decide they should probably go back to where they dug up that body and look for clues. And as they get back to the site where they pulled this thing out of the ice, who should re-enter the series but that filthy ragamuffin kid from the cave of uh, penal colonists? I think there's some issues with how they do the mythology in the show, but they're very consistent with bringing stuff back. And I couldn't believe that we'd see these people again. I was sure it was one and done. It's true. I mean, the kid takes Devin and Danzinger back. They meet with the Scottish guy, the elder, who's taken over control. Like, he's now the leader of this group. And he's got tons of information for them. But the entire time I'm watching this, I was just like, go live with them. Yeah. They're so close. You can just go live with them for the well, winter. Well, there's, there's a couple issues. One in the other episode, they made it very clear that these people are so well hidden, you can't find them. That it's like, you know, without being mystically dreamscaped brought over you're not going to find them and secondly if you do have them here please for the love of god you guys are starving just say to them can we stay here or can you help us with food instead of the mystery of the psychic energy caveman tarian give us some apples yeah exactly it is just so funny because i'm like you now know two entrances to live with them and you guys just got to move in with them it's 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 the simplest solution (laughs) anyway um the old scottish guy uh tells them all about there's a there's a legend amongst the modern Tarians that uh i guess when these ancient Tarians were far more indiv- individualistic than current Tarians are i guess the idea being they weren't they they didn't have this group mind that i guess we're supposed to think these current Tarians have before they were socialist uh, am i right <laughs> <laughs> and the Tarian legend says that uh they took those old urges they used to have and they condensed them into a single Tarian who they buried away in the earth so uh, this is kind of like, ooh, is this this original Tarian with all of their base instincts in it? And uh, he, the old Scottish guy tells them they may have destroyed the ancient Tarian's body, but that energy is impossible to kill with just the physical realm. So it's probable that uh, the energy escaped the body, attempted to possess that Tarian in camp, but the Tarian, or not Tarian, the Grendler in ta- camp, the Grindler couldn't take it, so he exploded, and the energy must be living inside one of them. Yeah, and I think this is about 30 minutes into the episode, and I thought, this is way too long to the episode to essentially get things going. I mean, that's the thing is, I actually like, like, I kind of like, they're going to do that classic The Thing thing now, where they're like, everyone needs to get tested individually yeah. to see if they can figure out who has the entity in it. I liked the idea of the, like, spooky Freddy Krueger ghost story beforehand. It just wasn't, like, nothing is given room to breathe or, like, executed, like, particularly well. So, like, I like elements of this. And I, I'll be honest, for the first little bit, I wasn't sure who was going to have the Tarion in him, like, the spirit inside, or who was going to be possessed. So, but it's, you're right, it's not quite well executed enough to work. Because we go from here to Devin and Danzinger now pretending that that radiometer that, I guess, reads psychic energy is fixed what they're doing is like i guess it's placebo like they bring one people in one person at a time they hold out this device and they're like it's scanning you and they're just hoping that person will give themselves away even though the scanner doesn't work it was a weird plan right it is a weird plan and like 
we're at this point kind of leaning toward it being Alonzo because you know we know Alonzo dream goes into dreamscape a lot and hangs with Tarians. They've really sort of seeded the idea that maybe Alonzo's the one who's looking a little bit like out of sorts. And so when they bring him in to scan him, they like make the scanner start dinging to freak him out, I guess. And Alonzo gets pretty upset, starts speaking like he gets really keyed up. He's very suspicious. Like he pulls a knife and he's just like, "I'm not the Tarian possession guy." It's that classic thing where you're not guilty so you start acting increasingly guilty for no other reason other than it serves the purpose of the show exactly but we're very quickly they they, they give up on this like who's the tarian thing because dan Ziger leans in to be like it's clearly him and we see his eyes go yellow like the ancient yeah. tarians and we're like oh it's dan Ziger. dan Ziger's been possessed yeah so alonzo takes his knife he's pulled on them cuts his way out of the dome and runs off into the woods like inno- any innocent person would <laughs> And is this where he uh, slashes uh, Danziger too? Is it now or is it later? Oh, he must do it now too. You're right. Yeah, he slashes him in the face, so he gets like a little scar on his face. It is very funny. It's just like the, uh, this is the way an innocent person behaves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, now Danziger, Devin, and Doctor Heller have to go after him, and like they're like, "Oh, we have to go stop Alonzo or something." And this is kind of where the episode, like for me, I, you know, it hasn't been like a perfect episode by any means up till now, but it especially starts to fall apart now. Because, like, they're like, we got to go after Alonzo. And Dr. Heller's like, I'm coming with you. So Dan Zinger, who we now know has been possessed by the Tarian and has up to this point been very incognito. Like, you wouldn't know it was him up till now. Yeah. He just grabs Dr. Heller and starts roughing her up. He's, like, going to hit her. He's just like, you can't come with us. I won't let you. And I'm just like, he's, he just gives him, he suddenly becomes the most obviously possessed by a Tarian to the point that even Devin and Dan Zinger, or Devin and Dr. Heller immediately are like, oh, well, it's this guy. Yeah, and uh, it, again, it's that sort of thing. It's like, and why does he do it? it? Just because we need to wrap the show up, that's why. Yeah, just because it's ending. I'm like, up till now, you've done a perfect job blending in with this group as Danzinger. Why are you blowing it now? You're ruining this a- ancient Tarian spirit. You could have yeah. pulled this off. But they go down to the caves. While they're looking, Julia and uh, Devin hit him with torches. Oh, yeah, because they got to get that gun away from him. Yeah. It is this what happens. They end up back in those caves. Like, Alonzo's running around the woods. I don't know what his plan was, but the ragamuffin kid thankfully finds him, takes him back to meet the Scottish guy, and the Scottish guy's just like, hey, man, you're, like, the best at dream walking. You're the best. you got the best <laughs> dream skills. You get in there. You dream around. It's up yeah. to you. Only you can go into the dreamscape and stop the ancient Tarian. So uh, Alonzo tracks down Danzinger. They get a little a little fist fight so that Alonzo can uh, knock him unconscious and they can mind meld together. And then Alonzo goes to Dreamscape, fights the ancient Tarian. Like he, in the Dreamscape, he like borrows a Tarian's like zapper stick and like zaps it, yeah. and the ancient Tarian explodes into pixels. Well, it's because he used the planet's power, Luke. That's what they said. He didn't use his own power. He used the planet's power. He used the planet. You're right. He used the planet. They also said to us, too, there's a voiceover that also tries to explain what happened, where Alonzo's voiceover is, uh, the one way for him to stop the de- the demon's anger was to release his own. And I was just like, is that what, what, is that what happened? <laughs> it is funny, though, because you're right. They take a lot of time to kind of give you a bit of a fake out and uh, who did it and all this sort of stuff. And then they have to wrap things up real quick. And like, oh, yeah, it's because of the planet's power and he's good at dreamscape and everything's everything works out. It's about tapping into your own anger. I'm like, that, none of those things were the theme of this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's really it. Yeah, and it just ends with uh, Danziger going up to Alonzo to apologize for being possessed, as if that's his fault. Well, that was weird because they also mentioned that he can't remember anything. I'm like, what's yeah. he apologizing for? The only thing I liked about that apology is he apologizes, and then Alonzo goes, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why did he say it like that? <laughs> He's baby Italian. And that wraps up the big possession episode. Um, yeah. The next one is episode 19. And here's the IMDb summary for survival of the fittest. Alonzo. We're going to die here. Morgan might not even last the next 24 hours. You're taking his side? I'm not taking his side. I'm taking our side. Even just a little bit will be enough moisture and protein for us to survive just a little while longer. No. That grandma could save our lives. With narration by Danzinger, a scout team in search for much-needed supplies 
finds that Cargo Pod 9 has been completely looted. Now, in need of rescue after crashing the rail, Danzinger and Alonzo pursue a Grendler for its stash. And that was courtesy of R.W. Zim DPA. Oh, it's that old that old uh, R.W. whatever his name is. Good for him. Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was hoping at the beginning of this episode there was going to be a line where, because again, they're looking for food again, basically. And they should have had a line where Danziger's like, you know, we're still looking for food because you spent all that time with the old uh, possession caveman. It's true. He's really, really holding it to old Dr. Heller. Yeah. I mean, it does start off, Danzinger's assembled a very motley crew to go find a cargo pod number nine. I was surprised by the crew he is running with. Uh, it's, yeah, why didn't he him. bring all those background characters? That's what I thought, too. But it's it's him. It's Alonzo, which makes sense. It's Dr. Heller, who shouldn't be leaving the camp. They need a doctor. And Morgan. These are the these are the three people he's chosen to accompany him. Yeah, well, it's like they need Morgan. He hasn't done anything for a while, but he also has no skills and has no ability to help anything. And... What's kind of crazy is they sort of set this up. I thought this is where the episode was going, but they abandoned this very quickly. But they're tracking down this cargo pod nine that they got like a, a pulse from, I guess, which is a signal from it. And it's really set up at these early moments as Danzinger's white whale. Like this is the thing he needs to mm-hmm. find. Cargo pod number nine. They keep mentioning number nine. And I thought this was going to be a whole white whale episode. It's over before it begins this white whale thing because we meet them. They're on day eight of trying to find it. The camp calls in like... Devin at camp calls in to say they got a, a final uh, pulse from it. I guess it's it was as it as it died. This pulse shot out, telling it, telling them exactly where the uh, pod nine is, and it is um, two hundred and fifty kilometers from where they currently are. They've been looking in the wrong place, and now they have to decide because they're past the fail safe of their mission, where they've they don't have enough food to quite get back to camp unless they really cut down on rations. But if they're going to go even further out of their way, two hundred fifty kilometers out of the way to go to this thing, to go to this pod. They're going to be in real trouble is kind of like the question mark here. It's like, are they going to continue? Well, and I kind of thought this was, and maybe this is just me. I thought this was enough drama for an episode. I thought the point is, are you going to make the decision to go look for something in the hope of saving everyone, but the chances you might starve to death or die from the elements? And it could have been like this, see what their character is through this struggle. I thought that's what this episode's going to be, but it's more of a perspective what happened sort of well thing. that's it this is the setup it, it feels like it's going to be a survival thing it feels like danzinger is going to be like captain ahab trying to find pod nine like that's the setup and they really shift probably uh at the first act turn but that seems to be the setup here because they're like you shouldn't go you don't have enough food but despite morgan's objections they all are like well let's head off and see if we can find it because if there's what we need inside it will really save the camp on a side note when they mention, because they're driving around in one of their vehicles, they call it a rail. I, I keep forgetting that's what the name of these vehicles mm-hmm. are. They mention that it's 250 kilometers away. I know you're going to say. And they have this vehicle. And, like, I'll grant you, you probably can't drive 100 kilometers an hour. But, like, that's what? Still only two or three hours away, right? Yeah. Well, and there's that. And on top of that, and maybe this is being really picky, but does it make sense that the explosion happened and the ship Everything landed together, but this pod is so far away. Does that make sense that it drifted that far? I mean, they've implied that pieces of the ship are like across the planet, so it didn't bother me that much. But regardless, they should be able to make that in about two and a half hours. I, it did feel like that, but I, they're trying to set this idea. They've been out there for eight days already. When we ca- like, it cuts and we cut, and it's, it's the this, this super on the screen says it's day ten, and in the distance they finally see cargo pod nine. But unfortunately, when they arrive, the entire back end of the cargo pod has just been like completely like destroyed, probably on reentry. So there's nothing inside. There's no supplies to be had at all. Jordan, there's not even a can of cold heat. (laughs) I know, that sucks. That's the worst when that happens. What what do you think cold heat is? A can of cold heat? Maybe one of those like icy hot things where it's like hot at one point, then goes cool, like for your back pain. I was hoping it was like a, a like a nice future malt liquor, like after your hard after a hard day in the mines with your uh, boss on the station yelling at you over uh, laser cast. You go home and you crack open a can of cold heat to uh, unwind. Yeah, that's good. I love a cold heat. But essentially, they're like found the they found their white whale. There's nothing inside. It's all been a big waste of time, and they probably don't have enough supplies to get home. But you know what it's time for, Luke? What time is it? Search party. Search party. <laughs> You're totally right. Back at camp, they're like, well, we better go find them before they die out there in the wilderness. So uh, Yale grabs Wallman. Finally, one of our background characters gets mm-hmm. something to do. 
and they they head off to meet them halfway and resupply them. Does that timeline work out though that they were so far they were going to starve? Now these people could just get to them real quick. I mean, this is the thing. They're going to go out and get them. We get another jump in time. We cut and it says day 13. We cut to the uh, Pod 9 expedition, Danzinger and crew. They're driving back toward camp. They're all uh, arguing about shortcuts and who's to blame for, like, taking them out here. The usual arguing on this show. And somehow, while they're arguing, Danzinger takes his eyes off the flat road for two seconds and goes down a minor decline and flips the whole car. The whole rail gets flipped. (laughs) And up to this point, this was my favorite scene in in the episode was them arguing in the car. That's what I wanted the whole episode to be. Just them driving and arguing and very minor skirmishes along the way. That's what the show needs. Like a little road trip movie yeah, where they argue. That, that's what I wanted. Play some road games. Yeah, but it wasn't. It wasn't to be. Because they have to flip it and then they'd be like, oh no, Morgan's hurt. Yes, they, they flip the rail. Morgan's pinned underneath and can't feel his legs anymore. So they pull him out and set up camp. And they're like, I guess we'll wait here and hope someone comes for us, even though we have no communication and no way of telling them where we are. That's sort of the premise. And they're already kind of starving. So what's going to happen? Then we do another time jump. It's day 17. Four more days have passed. Yeah. And Yale and the team find him. Yeah. Yale and Wellman pull up, find him. The entire crew is passed out but alive. They wake them up. And this drove me crazy, but I the entire time they, after they flipped the rail, I'm just like, just push it over, you guys. It's just on its side. You'll be fine. And what you see next is Wallman and Alonzo just push it over <laughs> and get going again. I thought the same thing. I was like, why didn't you guys just do this before? It's like they just all gave up to die for some reason. Because they're all just, when they see them too, it makes it look like an explosion has just happened. They're all like laying at other parts, like in the dirt. And I'm like, why? What's happened? Um, and Yale notes when they've discovered them, it's like, Hmm, they all seem healthier than they should be after all this time. And isn't it strange how they won't talk to each other? Yeah, they're all maybe being a little bit cagey. And then he also notices that their photon phaser gun thing has been fired. Jordan, it's called a Meg Pro. <laughs> the Meg Pro's been fired, sorry. So what's happened in this four days since they flipped their uh, flipped their rail? Yeah, and my note at this point was, who cares? Who cares what happened? <laughs> We hop back to camp, and uh, they're all having nightmares. The funniest one, though, is Morgan's in bed flipping around, and he, like, sits up out of bed out of his nightmare in that classic, like, bad dream pose, and his, he has the wildest bed head because his hair is so long. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh so hard at that. Um, but essentially, they wake up the next morning. Everyone's getting ready for breakfast, and what they discovered is someone's dropped by camp that night, propped up a dead Grendler on a stick in the middle of camp. Second dead Grendler in camp in two days. I actually thought when we first saw it, it was pretty cool because I thought someone had taken a Grendler and impaled him on a spike. Right. And I was like, oh, wow, that's gruesome. But then you, when you get a closer look, they've just made like a T with some sticks and it's like leaning its shoulders over it. And I thought, yeah, well, that's not as cool. It's just this propped up uh, Grendler corpse. And they know it's very quickly. It's been killed with a Meg Pro wound to the chest. Oh, no. What could it have been? That, what a coincidence. Well, it's very funny. Everyone's looking at it, and they look back at the Pod 9 crew, and they all just are looking very guilty. And they're like, well, yeah. I guess we should ask what happened while you were unconscious for four days. Yeah, I hope they each give their perspective. Yes, they. we end up in a not-quite-Rashomon-style series of flashbacks. Because all of their stories are pretty much the same, it's not Rosh. You're not seeing it from different people's perspectives. Well, that was the thing I was kind of hoping for. I thought what we were going to do here at this point, and I think it's an interesting narrative technique for this show, that they're going to tell a story. They're all going to have slightly different perspectives, which you're not really sure what's true. Maybe you're going to get little bits of information that you didn't get in the other story, and at the end, you're kind of going to get the idea of what happened. But you're right. When you do the first two flashbacks or memories or whatever you want to call them, I couldn't even tell what was different in them. It was like two people telling me the same story. I was like, what, why am I watching this? Yeah, the stories ultimately aren't different. We're just, we're basically just being slowly fed what happened. Yeah. There's no truth and lies. Um, Danzinger basically sits down and tells the entire camp what happened out there and why there's a dead Grendler now propped up outside. Um, Oh, and that Grendler comes with the Grendler who brought it there is now also sitting on a side of a hill, just staring at them very unhappily. Well, and they're very, and I mean, it's true to form for this uh, group of people. They're very paranoid and they're very trigger happy, sort of like, oh, we're worried this Grendler, but the Grendler is literally just sitting there. Like maybe it's an ominous 
sort of thing to have someone just sitting there staring at you. But he's not being aggressive in any sense. No, I mean, he's definitely dropped off a dead body for you, and you should ask what those people did out in the woods. But Yeah. But he's just sitting there. Yeah, so Danzinger's flashback basically shows them back at that camp they set up after they flipped their car. They're starving. He's hallucinating. He sees True out in the fields, but he realizes it's just a Grendler running around. So Danzinger and Alonzo decide they'll follow that Grendler back to its cave, hoping to find some supplies. They get to the cave. It's dripping acid for no reason. Like, that never comes back. They're just like, yeah. hey, this cave drips acid. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just to build this world, Luke. Just like I thought for sure that was gonna be important that there's dripping acid. But even like even between flashbacks, I thought it was gonna be like Danzinger was wrong, it wasn't dripping acid, but no, it is. It's always dripping <laughs> acid. So we've got by the way, we've got some caves that drip acid and some caves that have portals to other parts of the planet. These caves are great. Via cobwebs. They really need to investigate these caves. There's a lot yeah. of opportunities in them. Uh, true. Uh they find this Grendler they wanted to follow. The Grendler is uh, pissed off that they've showed up in their cave. It's waving its little Grendler arms around. The little puppets dance around in front of them. And uh, Danzinger's f- pretty freaked out by this angry Grendler. So we get the best shot of this entire series. He falls back, pulls out the Meg gun, and he shoots the Grendler in the chest. And the Grendler just like, it's the most brutal shot. It's the Grendler's chest explodes flies 20 feet across the cave and slams into a wall and then falls yeah, over Yeah, it's like head. suddenly became like a John Woo movie just for this so one good. scene. I loved it so much. And we get to see it a few times because of the yeah. flashbacks. Yeah, because the flashbacks are all exactly the same. So like, hey, remember that shot we did? Guess what? You're going to see it a couple more times. I cheered. I was just, I was sad <laughs> for the Grendler, but man, it was a great, it was a great, I was just a chest exploding and throwing something across a room. Yeah, but what we do we think is it looks in this version, although it's again, it's going to be pretty much the same version every time. That the Grendler was being a kind of aggressive. It was it was being crazy. So da- Danzinger had to shoot it. Yeah, and of course, as as Danzinger finishes the story, the camera cuts to Doctor Heller and Alonzo. They're looking pretty skeptical about that story. What's the mystery here? Yeah, I mean, keep tuning in because you, you won't believe it. Yeah, we essentially get to hear Alonzo's side of it next because Alonzo is outside hanging out with Baines and Wallman, who are staring at that Grendler who just won't. Uh, won't leave uh won't leave this camp alone and uh they're like well, maybe we should just shoot it so it leaves us alone and alonzo gets all upset he's like ah we shouldn't do that uh we don't know we don't know what it wants you guys don't understand its perspective on things why don't you tell why don't i tell you what i saw back in time yeah they flash back we get to see the exact same scenes pretty much play out from alonzo's perspective but there's no changes they're almost exactly the same they go to the cave there's ass in the cave grendler's angry really the only difference we see this time is alonzo gets a glimpse of i don't know it might be a nest with eggshells in it Mm -hmm. and then he yells before danzinger shoots hey maybe don't shoot this grendler but then the grendler just gets shot i mean the only thing i think slightly just before they go to the cave is that Danziger in his version is slightly more aggressive. Like they tussle a little bit, and I think he accidentally hits Julia. That's Other later. than that, that's not even that's not even this flashback. It's not. Oh no, so that's it's not like... even that's not even in dispute. <laughs> right. It, yeah, he's just like maybe slightly more aggressive, and maybe the Grendler is slightly less aggressive. But honestly, it seems like it's the exact same shots from the last flashback. Yeah. The only difference is like maybe there are Grendler eggs in the cave or like shells. Yeah. Unknown. This just leads back to camp where there's a big debate about like what they do about that Grendler outside. And they're for the first time, which is crazy, they're like, hey, maybe he's upset that his friend was killed. Do you think we can compensate him for the loss? They should have given him Yuli. Yeah, just give him Yuli. It's fine. Here, take this. This is yours now. Um, and it's at this point that Morgan busts into the dome. He's like, wait, let me tell you my side of the story. Yeah. And it's just like, who cares, man? From from Morgan's perspective, he was laid up in bed. They never explain how he gets use of his legs back. They medically cure him, I guess. But he was at camp, unable to move, just laying in this bed. This all is happening after Danzinger's originally shot this Grendler. So they're sitting around, and Grendler's just... Or, sorry, Grendler. Danzinger's just like, hey, you guys, what would you say if we eat that Grendler? What would you say to eating that Grendler back in that cave? <laughs> Alonzo's not into it, so he and Danzinger are getting a big fist fight over whether they should eat it, which is, this is what you were remembering right. before, is they get a big fist fight over whether they should eat the Grendler. Dr. Heller tries to, like, break them up, and Danzinger just cold cocks her in the face. Well, well she shouldn't have got involved, I guess. Shouldn't have got involved. But even despite that, after getting punched in the face, Dr. Heller's like, I agree, let's get us some uh, old Grendler steaks. Yeah. They'll be good, they'll keep us alive. And you know what else might be good? 
since we're going to cut it up and we're thirsty, maybe we should, uh, you know, get a little Army Hammer style and drink some of that blood. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, that's a reference. Do you think by the time this airs, that will still be a story? Uh, Who knows? But uh, I just thought it was so crazy. I was like, you're going to drink... It's like this is this is your plan. Let's let's cut it up fair, and drink its blood. The Grendlers love drinking human blood. Oh, it turn about's fair play. Exactly. Imagine if that was really good to humans. They're like, oh, this is tasty. Yeah, this tastes like like Pepsi. <laughs> we cut to the next. Like, so the story says, let's go cut up the Grendler and get its blood and meat. In the flashback, we cut to the next morning, and it's Morgan laying in bed, and Julia's handing out fresh piping hot mugs of Grendler blood to drink and he's like being given a cup and he's like I changed my mind I don't think I want to drink this and have we seen like the the actual butchering at this point or is that another flashback no there's still more to come Joe. more okay. flashbacks yeah we great. just this is just them uh coming to realize that they ate the Grendler slash drank its blood and coffee mugs well I mean I think the mug is the best thing to use right it was a shame because you never see what's in the mug like you really should have seen Morgan have to drink it and get like a like a blood mustache right <laughs> anyway uh, we cut back outside of these flashbacks now that the whole camp knows that they ate a grandler they're all having a big debate about whether it's cool to eat a grandler or not yeah they are surprisingly not put off by the idea of eating what is clearly an intelligent sentient creature they've like had trading deals with they're like you know what it's not a human is it and if what I did like is that background character, Baines, he starts floating this idea in the background. He's like, so you guys, like, they had a Grendler. Seems like we might be okay with that. Are we? How are we feeling about cannibalism right now? Yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> is cannibalism cool now, too? He should have done that. And all he just pulls up, like, a human leg. He's like, by the way, I've already started eating someone. <laughs> um, but it's at this moment, while they're debating whether it's okay to eat a Grendler, Dr. Heller's finally like, it's my turn to tell my side of this story. And we go back for the final flashback. Yeah. Uh, this is the this is the flashback where Dr. Heller's like, I'll come back with you, uh, Danziger, to the cave. I'm a doctor. I'll help you butcher this uh, Grendler. Which, by the way, if they did butcher it, wouldn't they have noticed cut out pieces when they dropped off the dead one? It just seems like it just got an injury. So I didn't understand, like, what they cut out of this Grendler. It is a thing, because you notice the one gunshot, but they don't notice that <laughs> it's had some finely cut meat removed. Because some ribs missing. They had yeah. a nice rib dinner. Uh, but... She goes back. She's going to butcher this uh, butcher this Grendler up. She gets uh, her hands covered in... Uh, the quality of this video we're watching was pretty hard to see, but it was either it either has black or very dark green blood, the Grendlers, apparently. Mm, I couldn't tell. It was tough to see. And uh, she goes to find some rags to wipe her hands off. And as she does, does she find... She finds, like, a green, like, squishy cylinder that she pokes now. Was that a... I believe they're trying to show us that there were Grendler babies in in this cave yeah and this was, so they killed a grendler mother and also all of its babies starved to death as a result of this death i think that's what they're trying to show and that's what they're trying to show i actually thought at first just because again it was a bit of a bad video quality i thought what they were going to find is they cut her open and there is still eggs or a grendler baby is still in a gestation period but yes what i think it they're supposed to be implying is that they have essentially killed a whole family uh, yeah by but through their actions now the entire Eden Project basically knows everything that happens has happened out there, that they've killed a Grendler, eaten it, and also, I guess, killed a bunch of baby Grendlers as an indirect result. Mm-hmm. It's, there's this weird scene where they all go to bed and, like, Morgan is forgiven by Bess for his actions because she's just happy to have him alive. Danzinger, like, breaks down crying over the whole thing and, like, forces his daughter True to, like, stroke his head as he cries. And she looks very uncomfortable the whole time. <laughs> Essentially, this is just a setup that, like, what a terrible thing has happened, and that Grendler outside is clearly unhappy with the murder of his friend and probable lover. Um, and we cut to the next morning. True is missing once more, but the Grendler's gone too. So they uh, all grab their guns and go to track down this Grendler because there's a, kind of an assumption that maybe he's come for revenge and taken True or something. Yeah. Maybe this is the trade. But what they do is when they find True and this Grendler, the two of them are just clearly having a conversation. Like it's just True and a Grendler just having a chit chat. This is a bit of an odd scene because because you're right. What you first get is that maybe he's abducted her as retribution. But then quickly when the camp runs in and, you know, Dan Ziggers got a gun and they're all ready to grab her back. And she's like, no, 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 he didn't abduct me. Like, I came on my own free will or someone says that at one point. But why? And what? Like, they can't communicate. What were they? The Grendler, she's just like, hey, hey, Grendler, 
I'm going to speak English and tell you I want to go with you and chat. And he's like, cool, we can't understand each other. And then they walk away for some reason. Like, it didn't make any sense. I mean, that is true. But I was also just like, this is the first person from the entire camp who's even attempted to, like, like you know, you at least go out and mime something with this thing. Like, find out what it wants. You well, know, we all to sleep on it, Luke. Yeah, we got to sleep on it. We don't actually believe these things are, like, worthy of our time. But regardless, she's not being kidnapped. They're having tea or something. They're having a chat. They're trying to figure out how to resolve the situation. And, of course, Danzinger's crazy, so he's waving a gun around. And she's yelling, Daddy, stop being crazy. Uh, it all basically amounts to Danzinger finally dropping the gun. And he, like, apologizes for killing the Grendler's friend. Yeah, you'll notice never apologizes for killing all of the babies, though. Well, collateral damage. Um, but essentially it all boils down to, like, the Grendler apparently, according to True, just wanted basically an apology, an explanation, and some acknowledgement from them that, hey, you, you killed my friend, that was a jerk move. And <laughs> Danzinger basically gives it to him, but Danzinger also, it's so funny, Danzinger's just like, hey, listen, I'm so sorry we did that, but, like, listen, if it makes you feel better, I got to live. So, like, I murdered it, but I lived. So, like, you know, it balances out, right? Like, I killed all your babies. I killed your friend. But, like, I lived. Yeah. So It was a weird moral they tried to push, which is because we were saved, that death wasn't in vain. It's like, but that wasn't what the Grendler was trying to do. It wasn't like the Grendler sacrificed itself so they could survive. You murdered it in cold blood and then ate it and then said, well, it was worth it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the weirdest. There's this whole thing here, too, where, like, because Danzinger will basically go with this Grendler, and the two of them will, like, basically dig a hole and bury the dead Grendler kind of as a way to make amends or something. But there's even, like, in his narration, he's just like, hey, isn't it crazy that other animals have empathy? Not like us humans. I thought only us did. I'm like, you guys don't have any empathy. Like, you guys couldn't figure out what this Grendler wanted. Like, it's pretty clear when you murdered and ate its friend, it's probably just unhappy with you murdering and eating its friend. Also, this show, we've complained about it before, but they love just resetting things and setting everything back to the status quo, regardless if it warrants it or not. And this was a turn that I think could have been interesting for some light serialization later on in a show that wants serialization, which is This could have been the beginning of bad relations between these two species. And it could have happened earlier on in the show. And there's always this problem because them being stupid humans have done something stupid and have made now essentially a war. But it's like, no, we buried him. Everything's kind of all right now. Yeah, we made uh, made it. We made it up to him. Like we ate their friend and killed them. But now we're we're cool. Don't worry about it. I also thought the same thing is I was just like, you've got all these background characters. Bring one of them into it. And then have to ha- like have to submit one of your background characters to Grendler Law, and this guy has to be executed for his crimes. Anything, anything other than I guess it's all right. It just made the whole episode, and it's a running problem with the show. Is at the end of the episode, you go, so what was the point of that? It's not even like this sort of serialization you'd get. Or sorry, the sort of single episode you'd get in like uh, you know a Star Trek or something, where you know what the moral is. And maybe it's being handled well, maybe not. But this is like, I don't know what the moral is. What was yeah, the point it, of this episode? It was crazy. That Like, the moral was like, if you kill someone, but you lived and it was worth so it's worth it. Like The, it was the moral all worth is it. the ends justify the means. That's the moral of this episode. And it's just like, not true. Like, it's like, not true. That person, that Grendler never got any, like, justice in any way, shape, or form. And a, a small nitpicky note, uh, they show, like, respect to it by burying it. And I was like... You guys don't know anything about the Grendlers. You don't know if the Grendlers bury their dead. Absolutely. How do we know that? Um, let's get into some final notes here. I wanted to note something about this episode that was like driving me crazy in a in a way during the whole episode. Not crazy, but it was. I thought it was so funny. It's that you know they come back from this trip, they flip this car, and the entire episode. Danzinger in particular, but all of them, they have huge wounds. Like Danzinger has a massive gash across his forehead. That is never dressed or treated. The yeah. entire time. Like I was just like, you're back at camp, you guys. You've got to treat your huge facial wounds. I'll tell you one thing of this show. I will give it marks that it didn't retcon that Danziger killed the Grendler, which just feels like something this show always does. Like they had for a moment some ambiguity and some real friction of, oh, a character did something bad. And this show has a history of erasing that. They didn't do that, which is good, but they did it in a in another way, which is almost they absolved lazier. Him. They, they absolved him. him. So crime. it's the same thing. But I was like, oh, you guys were so close and you just missed the mark. Like, why not just have a character do something bad and that be something that develop him from now on? Maybe maybe from now on, he's not so trigger happy. But no, they, they just wouldn't go with it. 
everybody has to be crystal clean, white as snow, like heroes. They can't, they like, everyone has to be absolved. It's crazy. Yeah. This is our penultimate episode. So our second last episode on Earth 2. Last, next week, we're finishing it off. I realized watching these two episodes, you remember when we took our hiatus from this. We left, we took a break. Mm-hmm. They had just arrived at this dome, basically. Now the series is almost over. We've basically watched the back half of it. I am shocked it is still winter. They're still in the same place. They haven't made any progress. I can't believe they've been dealing with this winter plot for like the entire back well, half of this the first weird season. thing about it is clearly they think this is interesting. And I think there is something inherent about the idea of this sort of being in a place and not having supplies to survive and stuff. But that's never what the episode is about. So it's just like, I don't know why they have to have them suffering because these episodes have been more episodic than the previous. But Uh, In some ways, even though I think I was wanting more individual standalone episodes, I just haven't liked these at all. It's just weird. It is. It felt like something they'd get past much quicker. And I'm just surprised they've spent so long with the premise they were trapped in winter. I I assume they'd be back on the road by now. I have a feeling that in the last two, they'll be finally out. All right. Well, I got one last little note for you when we can move on, Jordan. The director and writer of this last episode, Survival of the Fittest. There was a writer-director who took care of this episode. Wow. He's an all-star for Continuum Drag. <laughs> I'm sure. First of all, two credits we know him for. First, he directed an episode of Nightmare Cafe. Oh, that gem. But more importantly, Jordan, he also wrote and directed the Dune miniseries. Oh, wow. Really? So this guy's a real writer-director. He's shown up writing directing on series all over the place. Wow. I think Dune was better than this. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no. All right, Jordan. Let's let's write these. Uh, what about after the thaw, the Terry in possession episode? I have a feeling I like this less than you did. It just felt like I don't know how to say it, like a stopgap episode that's happening way too late in the series. Like this is the point of the series while we're getting to the end of the season, where I want them to start wrapping up some of the mythology and some of the serialization to start giving us some answers. And instead, they're giving us these weird monster of the week episode that I just don't think work at all. And again, I've said, I think early on, I wanted more individual episodes, but just not this way. I just didn't like it. I'm gonna give it a three out of 10. Three out of 10. Wow. I know. I just didn't like it. I, I clearly liked it better than you. It's not a great episode. I think it misses the marks on most of the places where it should have doubled down with like the haunting and the dream monster and even when it gets to the point where you're like let's test people let's do the thing where we're, we're we don't know who it is and everybody has to get their blood print kind of thing i will say though and maybe it's just me i wasn't 100 percent sure who the tarian was until they really gave it away so i did like that there was a little bit of mystery for me but overall it's like the a weak execution of a potentially good idea i'm gonna give it a six Holy moly, that's really high. I think. I, I think you're. I think you're. Uh, you're at the end of the series, and you're. You want it to be over. <laughs> well, that is true. But again, I do think it just feels like th- really, guys. We're nearing the end, and this is what you give us. This like, who's the villain? I was like, a oh, guy. Like, I'm so beyond this at this point. Like, move on. All right, let's go to survival of the fittest. We're probably going to disagree again. I think this was a slightly better episode. I think it has the same problems the show has had episode after episode, where a lot of the time you're like, I don't know if this makes any sense but i think it was i think they executed what they're trying a little bit better if even didn't really again they sort of absolve him at the end but i'm gonna go right down the middle five out of ten. Five out of ten i mean yeah i think this episode is indicative of the last episode on the show be- episode before there's a good premise here the maybe rashomon possible style idea them eating a grendler like that's a that's a good premise that i'm glad they got to it eventually I won't lie, I loved when they shot that Grendler across the room. That's still, like, one of the highlights of this entire show for me now, because it's a great shot. Mm. But, you know, it just doesn't quite... They don't quite know how to articulate it properly to make it work. There's the mealy-mouthed ending where everyone's just forgiven because there are heroes. I think it's just going to go another six. It's interesting, something you mentioned, though. This show, and specifically, I think, the last episode with eating the Grendler... The show's always wants to show them like sort of like building relationships between cultures and learning and growing. And they sometimes kind of fumble it, sometimes don't fumble it. But what I think I realized is the show doesn't really have anything to say. It doesn't have anything to add to the conversation that they seem to want to have. And I think maybe that's my biggest problem with the show. It's just like it has nothing to say. It's just about feeling things. And those things they want you to feel are never really justified. So at the end, you're kind of left feeling empty. Is that fair? I mean, I think what it, I think you're not wrong. I think especially in this last half, like 
you could look at an episode and like I think if you were to see the log line, there's a premise there where you could have something complicated and interesting, but because they don't want it to have to come back to it later, really. They usually don't want too much serialization. They also want their heroes not to be bad guys or have any like moral gray area. So it's it's like they always kind of are like, oh, here's an interesting situation that if dug into could be like really cool. But we, they're always afraid to go there. They don't want to, They want to wrap it up. They want our heroes to be heroes at the end. They don't really want to deal with what the, like the underlying issues of that are. So the morals are always nebulous. Nothing really kind of like adds up in the end because it just has to like reset or like our heroes have to be back on the good guy side, even though they're doing yeah. the bad thing. Well, they're bad at giving answers. They set up this sort of like, I'm always left thinking, how am I supposed to feel? And at the end, it's like, you're not really supposed to have thought anything. It's just like, hey, just give us your minimal attention. And it's crazy because it, it, it basically is like here are pilgrims. Here's a colonist arriving in a new world, taking advantage of new world and like interacting with people who have a right to be there when you do not, mm-hmm. which is the premise of the show, except they don't want their characters to be bad guys. So we're so we're literally are looking at the colonists encroaching on things. And we have every episode we have to be like, but don't worry, they're the good guys. And it's like it's impossible. You can't be the colonist and the good guy. And you add with that all these elements that. I think on their own work, I feel like they're they're piling too much on the show. You have the mythology of the planet, the mythology of the Grendlers, mythology of the Tarians. You also have these uh, universal soldiers going around killing people. You also have these weird guys having dream signals from his mom. You have uh, another group that live under the ground. You also have the overarching plot of the bad guys who are maybe trying to draw them to a planet. And it's like, but none of it really jives with one another because they don't want to go all in maybe and so you just get like we're going to build on this mythology like but it's not really building it's just adding more stuff that isn't coloring anything yeah you just layer on top of what's already there but you don't add to it really yeah so it's just like i'm like oh so this episode uh, we learned this about the grendlers does it add anything not really oh okay great thanks for the episode (laughs) oh dear well Let's wrap this up. So, listener, if you have any thoughts on these uh, two episodes of uh, Earth 2 or anything Earth 2 related, you can reach us at Continuum Drag. Uh, that's not the email. It's ContinuumDrag at gmail.com. There we go. It's right. You've never uh, done it before. I've never. This is my first time. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, on Instagram and Twitter, uh, you can find out more about the series. What am I saying? I'm so lost right now. You can watch clips on Instagram and there Twitter. There you go. <laughs> It's, the handle there is at continuum drag. Yeah, you'll get to get that shot of the Grendler flying, getting shot, them, I don't know, killing babies. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking that Grendler blood. Yeah, I, exactly. Oh, that shot was better. It should have been blood pouring down his face. Just dripping down his chin. Oh, God. Um, but that wraps it up for the episode. Listener, thank you for joining us. And Jordan, I'll see you next week to end see this on. Continuum Drag is recorded in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rex Seedler, produced by Jordan Dulloch and Luke Black. Special thanks to Aaron Hughes.